Okay, give me a moment, sir. Good evening and a warm welcome to all the dignitaries present here. Myself, Asya from Clarnet, assigned as the session assistant to ensure a seamless experience. Clarnet stands as India's most relied upon digital platform, offering a multitude of enriching services exclusively for doctors. It is with great pride that Clarnet is the digital partner of this event, Society of Onco Anesthesia and Peroperation. So, yeah, period of vision care, yes, ma'am. And the, uh, so let's begin today's session, for which I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Sohan Solanki, sir. Kindly proceed with your talk, sir. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Asya. And uh, I welcome all of you to this 54th uh, this webinar series of SOPSI. And uh, for today's uh, <clears throat> session, we have a special case presentation. So it is the case presentation on a patient for a poster for the right hepatectomy. So for this, uh, we have our fellow, uh, Dr. Nidhi Satish, who is a fellow in oncolysisia and <clears throat> pain medicine. So he will be presenting the case. And we have our model shop, uh, the senior consultant at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Hospital and Research Institute at uh, Delhi. And for this session, we also have three expert panel. So the one from the, uh, Dr. Vijaya Patil, she's professor and head of clinical anesthesia, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And we also have Dr. Uh, she is professor of anesthesia pain in, in, in same Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And we also have Dr. Tapas Mandal, who is a senior consultant at, at HN Reliance Hospital, Mumbai. So all these are faculties are expert in managing this uh, liver cases for hepatectomy. So I think we will have, have a, a good session. So uh, with uh, without delay, I uh, hand over to Dr. Shagun Bhatia Shah, so he's uh, the moderator for this session. So Dr. Shagun, please. Thank you for the kind introduction, sir. And thank you all for joining me in this session. And as we all know, it's a topic of uh, great importance and current relevance. A uh, hepatocellular carcinoma patient, that's whom we all encounter for liver re resections. And Dr. Nitin Satish has present, uh, will present it beautifully today. He'll give us a case presentation and then we'll take it up with the three expert panelists and we'll go ahead with our questions. And all the viewers are requested to jot down their questions in the chat box and those shall be taken up at the end of the case report and discussion. Right. So without much ado, over to Dr. Nitin mm -hmm. so that we can proceed on this important topic. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, first of all, let me thank Dr. Sohan, sir, and the SOPC uh, platform for giving me this opportunity. Uh, without further ado, I uh, proceed to the uh, case presentation on hepatectomy. So for today's case, we have a 69-year-old male who is a known case of long-standing diabetes, mellitus, and hypertension and also a recently diagnosed case of metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis, which is a, a revised way of saying uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And he is presenting uh, to our PAC initially for a right posterior sectionectomy and SOS a right hepatectomy in view of the hepatocellular carcinoma that was detected in the segment six and seven. <clears throat> So uh, the patient had a chief complaint of last loss of appetite since the last five months, which was associated with a mild upper abdominal pain. So he initially presented to the hospital with a loss of appetite, which was associated with nausea and an early satiety since five months. Soon after which the patient also developed abdominal pain in the upper abdominal region since two months, which was insidious in onset, which is gradually progressing from abdominal comfort to a mild in city dull aching pain which a numerical rating score of two was given by the patient. And it was not associated with any aggravating and relieving factors. There was no other history of jaundice, pruritus, tremors, or of abdominal distension. And there was also no history of vomiting, hematemesis, or melena. Coming to the past history of the patient, since, like I mentioned, the patient is a long-standing case of diabetes and hypertension. He's a diagnosed case of diabetes mellitus since 15 years, and he is currently managed on oral hypoglycemic agents. He's taking bildagliptin 50 mg and metformin 500 mg uh, once a day. And he's also been diagnosed case of hypertension since 20 years, well-controlled on metoprolol 25 mg, 
silnidipin 10 mg, telmasartan 40 mg, all taken once a day. Although the patient did not give any history of ischemic heart disease or chest pain or dyspnea on exertion, there is a history of angiography which was done in 2021. Although the uh, particular documents of the angiography were not available to the patient, on further inquiry, it was found that he had gotten the angiography done after routine ECG showed Q waves and some old ischemic changes. There's also no history of uh, tuberculosis, hepatitis, cerebral vascular accidents, chronic kidney disease, asthma, or COPD. Patient did give a history of occasional alcohol intake, and it was stopped since five years. There is no sur previous surgical history, no history of blood transfusions, and no history of known drug allergy. And Coming to after the diagnosis of the hepatocellular carcinoma, the patient was also not received any chemotherapy or any uh, other um, uh, therapeutic um, or palliative management, like any kind of uh, uh, biliary drainage procedures were also not done. General physical examination patient was in our PAC was a FFI and the vital signs were stable. He was moderately built and well nourished, and he was oriented to time, place, and person. He had a BMI of 27.7, so he's quite well nourished. He had a moderate to good effort tolerance, and he was able to climb two flights of stairs. He had a good breath holding time of 30 seconds, and the airway examination showed a malampati grading of three, and he was edentulous, but the neck extension was normal. Systemic examination, I have not elaborated here, but there was no... Uh, finding that was significant in the systemic examination. Even in the per abdomen examination, it was soft and non-tender. There were no signs of any caput medice or uh, ascites or any uh, signs or features of uh, shunts. So coming to the investigations, uh, I have the investigations which was done on 4th of last month, which was the uh, investigations to which he presented to the clinic. He had a hemoglobin of 11.7, a platelet count of 243. His creat was on the highest side of 1.41, most likely either due to uh, long-standing diabetes and hypertension-related nephropathy, and his electrolytes results were normal. He did have an increased uh, blood sugar count of 347 on presentation. Coming to the liver uh, function, a test that was done. He had a good albumin count of 4.16 and a total bilirubin of 1.14 and the uh, AST, ALT uh, enzymes were within normal limits. The PT INR was also on the normal limits of 1.25 INR and an APTT of 28.8. So uh, in the basic first screening that we done in the PAC time, we note uh, to the patient to having an uncontrolled sugar level but otherwise, in terms of his liver function, even the child pug scoring that was done, so far we have him on the as a child pug uh, classification A. And the patient uh, underwent the surgery on 27th. So we had a repeat investigations which were done on 26th. And we also, in terms of the pre, uh, pre operative uh, prehabilitation, we had uh, ha the patient was sent to a physician for. Uh, optimization of his uh, blood sugar levels and also in view of the old history of uh, MI or query MI that he had, the patient was sent to a phys uh, physician for optimization. A nutritional reference and a dietitian reference was also made so that we can optimize and a pre-operative incentive spirometry was also uh, advised. Coming to the investigations that were uh, repeated on 26, that is one day prior to the uh, uh, surgery planned. His hemoglobin had improved to 13 and the platelet count was now 195. The creat, in, initially we had done on 23rd to see the trend of creatinine, showed a declining trend of 1.21, although now it had jumped to 1.5. The rest, the blood sugars were getting, uh, were uh, now under control. And the liver function test continued to remain within the normal range. Just give it seconds to go through that. A repeat of the APTT and INR on the day prior also showed that the patient had an INR of 1.13 and an APTT of 34.7. I have mentioned the control values on the side as well. So the ECG continued to show non specific changes. I will share the ECG in the next slide. 
And a 2D echo cardiography was done, which showed a normal LV systolic function, no evidence of pulmonary artery hypertension. Patient did have grade one diastolic dysfunction and there was no regional wall motion abnormality. A six minute walk test was conducted and he was able to walk 600, uh, sorry, 400 meters in the duration of six minutes with no desaturation. Uh, upper GI endoscopy revealed only corporal erythema and no other findings of any varices or any other abnormality. This is the uh, uh, cancer-specific antigens and uh, tests that were done, which showed the uh, load of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is the patient's ECG that was done. And here we do find that in the lead 2 and AVF, we have a small Q wave uh, present available. Uh, and there is no other specific changes. There were, is also a poor progression of the R wave, but no clear uh, significant findings in the ECG indicative of ischemic heart disease or blocks. A triphasic CT abdomen, which was done on 22nd, showed an arterial enhancing segment 6 and segment 7 lesion with a delayed venous washout and a pseudocapsule enhancement because of the Central non with central non enhancing necrotic areas. It was of 8.7 to 8 into 9.2 centimeters in the segment of 7 and uh, 6, and it was highly suspicious of hepatocellular carcinoma. It was an exophytic lesion. <clears throat> the other lobes were noted to be normal, and the left lobe was considerably larger compared to the right lobe. And it was also noted that the right posterior portal vein was passing through the tumor and the right anterior portal vein was close to the tumor. Here I have shown you the images of the CT. Here we can see the, if my cursor is visible, uh, we can see the hepatocellular carcinoma. The, I have taken from the upper extent. We can see it extending down and it is... Uh, continuing down here and you can see the artery which is getting involved uh, the sorry the uh, portal vein which is involved in the art, uh, mass a liver elastography was also done on third which showed a shear wave mean uh, velocity of 1.7 and the median young modulus was 8.7 kilopascals which was corresponding to the f2 category of cirrhosis which showed significant cirrhosis and the patient was then diagnosed as a NASH with early changes of chronic liver disease. Like I mentioned, the uh, child pug scoring is of A, of score of 5. Uh, Indocyanin green retention test was done and the retention of at 15 minutes was 13.9 percentage. And the liver remnant, the functional liver rem remnant, which was calculated from the CT was 79 percentage. A pre-op TEG was also done in the night before the surgery. It was grossly within normal limits except for an increased lysis 30. The other parameters were within normal limits. So the patient was posted for a right hepatectomy on 27-6. After confirming adequate starvation and taking the consent after uh, con explaining the risk to the family and the patient, the patient was shifted inside. Standard ASA monitoring was applied. After confirmation of the patient's identity and the procedure, the patient was in induced after an epidural catheter that was placed using a Tohe's needle 16 gauge in the T89 space at, and it was fixed at 11 centimeters. It was a single attempt and there was no evidence of dural tap or uh, bloody tap noticed. After the placement of the epidural catheter, the patient was induced with propofol, fentanyl and atracurium and a eight number inter internal diameter endotracheal tube was inserted using a video laryngoscope number three blade. Patient was further then maintained on nitrous oxygen in uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation, isoflurane with the circle absorber and intraoperatively boluses of fentanyl were used and Relaxant was given as required. A 22 gauge arterial cannula was inserted in the left in radial artery for invasive blood pressure monitoring. The intravenous accesses that were taken include a right upper limb 18 gauge 
and a left upper limb 16 gauge for transfusion and a 22 gauge was in situ when the patient was wheeled in. And a left external jugular vein 16 gauge was also taken for massive, uh, in case of massive fluid uh, transfusions. A prophylactic antibiotic of Piptas 4.5 gram was given 15 minutes prior to the induction. And a Riles tube was also inserted and temperature probe monitoring was also done. At the end of the surgery, the estimated blood loss was 5.5 liters and the urine output in the intraoperative period was 600 ml. A Pringles maneuver was given, intermittent Pringles maneuver was given twice. And the first time it was given for 15 minutes and in the second time it was given for 11 minutes. Intraoperative noradrenaline was uh, given to maintain a mean arterial pressure of more than 70 milligram of uh, mercury. And similarly, injunction cal calcium gluconate, magnesium, as well as tranexa was given intraoperatively. The total fluids that were given included a ringer's lactate of 7 liters, normal saline of 500 ml, albumin, that is 5% 5 500 ml, gelifusin colloid 500 ml, and a total of 7 packed blood uh, PRBCs and 5 FFP and 6 cryo were given. Uh, so I will share the intraoperative tag and ABGs that were done. This is the in first intraoperative tag that was done. Again, it showed an increased lysis 30. And uh, prior to this, one gram uh, tranexa was given. And after the report of the tag, one more tranexa was repeated as well. This is the ABG that was done, which was before the uh, onset of uh, loss per se. It was a uh, grossly normal ABG. The lactate was 1.98 at the before the resection was initiated. This is done during the time of mobilization. This is the ABG that was done after 2.7 liters. There was a metabolic acidosis that was setting in, and lactic acid, lactic acid had rise to 4.38. Similarly, the calcium was noted to have be 2.6, and calcium gluconate boluses were given. And the hemoglobin was also noted to be 8.49. This is at the end of the surgery after a blood loss of 5.5 liters. The pH was 7.28, bicarbonate of 17, a hemoglobin of 12, calcium was now 3.5, potassium remained 3.95, lactate was 4.89. Glucose has remained normal intraoperatively throughout. So at the end, the patient did not undergo a right hepatectomy. The patient underwent a segment six non-anatomical resection with a right ICD placement, which was placed because of a diaphragmatic that was opened during the mobilization. A five centimeter rent was uh, made. So a right ICD was placed and the total duration of surgery was five hours and 20 minutes of which the surgical duration was of four hours. Patient was shifted to the ICU, intubated and sedated on injection noradrenaline support of 0 0.08 mics per kg per minute. The vitals were 111 and BP was, he was maintaining a BP of 138 over 70 millimeters of mercury. The lactates in the post-operative period, I will share that as well, showed this is the trend of lactate that was uh, done on POD0. Patient was extubated on POD1 and shifted to the ward on POD2. So this is the modified Makuchi incision that was made and we can see the ICT, uh, ICD in situ. Uh, this is the ABG that was done. Uh, this is the TEG and the ABG that was done at the end of surgery after the patient was shifted to the ICU. Here we see that the maximum amplitude has increased mildly to 74.1 from the upper limit of 69 and the other parameters were within normal limits. This is the ABG that was done immediately after shifting. And here we have the uh, pH of 7.27, a bicarb of 18. Calcium was 4.69 and the potassium was on the higher side of 5.17. And the lactate was 3.87. Uh, this is the trend of ABGs that were repeated uh, in the ICU. Here we can see that the uh, lactic acidosis had worsened a bit from the three. Now the pH has uh, come to 7.235 and lactate of 5.49. The hemoglobin has maintained throughout. 
and then after adequate hydration and albumin transfusion, the patient's lactates have started slowly declining after the initial uh, insult to the uh, liver. So the pH is now 7.32 and the lac um, bicarbs are slowly rising to 20 and he's still holding a hemoglobin of 10.54 and the other electrolyte reports were also normal on the ABG. So this is the uh, investigations that was sent on the evening. Uh, soon after the patient was shifted, that is on 27th, we have a hemoglobin of 9.7. The platelets had come down to 75. And on 28th early morning, the all the labs were repeated. Now the ABG uh, show and um, the lab showed a hemoglobin of 8.9. Platelets were holding at 75. The creat had come down now to a 1.06 from the previous 1.5. Potassium was 5.08. We note that the APTT has and the PT has not climbed much further from the previous reports. The APTT was 29.1, which is normal from the control, and the PT was 13.9. The SGPT and SGOT and PT had risen from the previous uh, values to a 167 and 125, and it continued to decline over the duration of the next PORI 2 and 3. The total BLE was also 1.33. So, uh, should I stop now, take some questions, and then go to the anatomy and physiology? Or uh, I mean, uh, I guess you continue, finish off with it, and we'll take up the questions because there are no questions in the chat box as yet. Chat box, you know. So either you explained it very well, or they are like sleeping post lunch. Uh, okay, ma'am, I'll just go through the brief uh, anatomy that was like so that people could probably understand the uh, non anatomical yeah. resection yeah. and the resection that was mentioned in this. So, uh, this is the uh, uh, segments of liver that was initially described by Kunnod. Uh, and here we see that the right lobe consists of five, six, seven, eight, and the left lobe consists of uh, one, two, three, four uh, segments of the uh, liver, which is basically divided by the uh, distribution of the portal uh, vein. So the earlier anatomical resections that were made for hepatectomy would follow these planes of the uh, vessels of the portal vein so that the blood loss would be less. So when we say that the patient was posted for a right hepatectomy, he would in, we would be looking at the excision of the 5, 6, 7 and 8 lobes or a posterior resection would be of the 6 and 7 lobe. Similarly, the, for the left lobe, we would have the, both the left medial and the left lateral uh, sections being resected. So, uh, this is the basic anatomy and the uh, forms of resection. And nowadays, given that the anatomical resections tend to have much more of healthier tissues also being salvaged, in this case, in, in our uh, surgery, what was done was we had an intraoperative ultrasound to delineate the uh, margins of the uh, uh, tumor as such and they were marked out a two centimeter uh, margin using ultrasound guidance and only the necessary tissue margin was resected saving us much more of the uh, functional liver uh, that will probably reduce the chances of post-operative liver dysfunction. Similarly I hope uh, most probably know that the uh, 70 5 percentage of the blood supply to the liver is from the portal vein and the uh, 75 to 80 percent and the rest remaining part is from the hepatic artery and the although the share of blood supply from the portal vein is much more the functional oxygen supply remains 50 50 uh, for both the uh, portal vein and the hepatic artery and they both have their own intrinsic as well as uh, extrinsic uh, methods of regulation Uh, coming to the uh, functional functions of the liver, which would probably help us in understanding even preoperatively if there is any sort of dysfunction and to identify postoperatively uh, how, how uh, if there is postoperative liver dysfunction because of the uh, resection, it is very important to know what are the functions or what are the things, parameters that could probably look out for. So uh, the liver is one of the largest, after skin, it is the largest organ in the body and it takes a very good supply of our uh, cardiac output. It uh, remains as a store of our blood. It plays a major role in the detoxification of 
uh, drugs and toxins and metabolites through its phase one and phase two uh, reactions. It is responsible for the uh, immune system by it uh, maintaining containing the uh, portal vein and the hepatic vein immune system. It is also plays a major role in the blood clotting uh, factors, you, uh, except for a two, five, and uh, one Willebrand and eight. Uh, the, all the other factors are produced from the uh, liver and uh, except for the vitamin K dependent uh, of which uh, the vitamin K dependence are also majority placed from the uh, liver as well. It also plays an important role in uh, oncotic pressure by in um, forming albumin and all the plasma proteins uh, are produced from uh, the liver except for the plasma proteins. And uh, similarly, it also plays a major role in the blood sugar balance. It is a storage of glycogen and it helps in the gluconeogenesis. And uh, hence, we have to keep a close look on the sugar values during the resection. Uh, so I'll just quickly run through some of the ERAS uh, guidelines that are uh, made. This is so uh, perioperative counseling. The patient should be receiving some sort of uh, counseling information. Some they have also mentioned that some kind of brochures or multimedia might help. The grade of recommendation is weak and the evidence is low. More importantly, is the prehabilitation, especially in patients who are at high risk. These would be patients who are elderly, patients who are malnourished, could be overweight or underweight, smokers, and patients with psychological uh, disorders prior to liver surgery. And ideally, prehabilitation should be conducted four to six weeks before the uh, operation. And the ideal time would be from the day or the from the minute the patient visits the surgical team and the surgery is in the line. It, that is when the patient should be uh, recommended for prehabilitation, starting from anemia correction, a nutritional correction, uh, exercise, uh, including both uh, chest physiotherapy or uh, chest intensive uh, say spirometry and free uh, balanced uh, aerobic exercise to increase the tolerance and similarly psychological counseling and anxiety reduction uh, strategies can be used uh, perioperative biliary drainage uh, they do recommend it when the uh, biliary uh, total bilirubin is more than 50 millimoles uh, per liter which corresponds to around 3 milligrams per deciliter and especially in uh, perihilar cholangiocarcinomas. And surgery should not be ideally performed until the bilirubin level drops uh, below three. And this is a strong recommendation and uh, there was moderate evidence. Preoperative smoking as a, and alcohol cessation at least uh, four weeks prior and uh, alcohol cessation is recommended for heavy drinkers eight weeks before the surgery. Uh, nutritionally, the patient needs a perioperative uh, nutritional assessment. There are many uh, modes like subjective global assessment and especially malnourished uh, patients who have uh, low albumin or has a weight loss of more than 10 percentage and a reduced BMI uh, should definitely get enteral supplementation at least 7 to 14 days prior to surgery. Uh, immunotherapy, uh, immunonutrition, sorry, uh, does, is not uh, very, uh, does not have a high level of uh, evidence and they've not recommended yet. Uh, preoperative fasting and uh, preoperative carbo load is definitely recommended and it is important to minimize the duration of uh, uh, fasting period to the uh, need, just the how much uh, how much ever is needed. So that would be a two hours for clear liquids and six hours for solids. And uh, carbohydrate loading is recommended on the evening before and on the uh, two to four hours before the induction. And uh, uh, coming to the pre anesthetic medication, they no longer. Uh, they ask us to avoid the long-acting anxiolytic drugs, especially in the elderly patients with uh, who are undergoing liver resection. And similarly, uh, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or gamepepinoids are no longer recommended. And the preoperative estaminophen should as well also be dose adjusted and depending on the uh, extent of resection. Uh, Anti-thrombotic prophylaxis are usually given and it is... Uh, to be routinely uh, started unless there are certain exceptional cases where the patients have a very a highly deranged uh, coagulation profile and are at a high risk of bleeding and intermittent pneumatic compression devices should be used as well. Uh, they do give, uh, the ERAS does recommend a steroid administration of methylprednisolone at uh, 500 milligram. Uh, however, in diabetic patients who are undergoing surgery, there is no recommendation as such. A microbial antimicrobial prophylaxis for uh, 
uh, surgical skin infection prophylaxis has to be given at least 60 minutes. Uh, it varies from uh, institution to institution, but whatever the antibiotic has to be given at least within the uh, 60 minutes, especially in, when where the cases there are of biliary reconstruction, there should be a targeted antibiotic uh, that, that is regime. If the, we have a preoperative bile culture, if it is, uh, we should have a targeted and they no longer uh, recommend a skin preparation with betadine, uh, rather a chlorhexidine alcohol solution is uh, advised. Uh, epidural and uh, uh, the other uh, intravenous pain modality uh, for open liver surgery, thoracic epidural and analgesia is uh, recommended. And the uh, even and the idea is that even if the epidural is placed, we should avoid hypotension and uh, it should not have too many catheters which would impede the mobility which is necessary to uh, have the patient on a pathway to rapid recovery. Similarly, multimodal analgesia with the use of intrathecal opiates is also recommended. Uh, there is no more uh, need for regional anesthesia techniques that are recommended in laparoscopic surgeries and multimodal analgesia with uh, intravenous opioids uh, is shown to give a functional uh, analgesia, although the uh, recommendation and evidence is low. So uh, epidural again, in especially in river resection patients, uh, has to be taken on an individualized basis depending on the uh, extent of resection the preoperative uh, liver dysfunction or the expected postoperative uh, liver dysfunction. The other option of wound catheter and transverse abdominis planes, which provide continuous local anesthetic, have been shown to have lower complications and almost an overall an equivalent analgesia to thoracic epidural analgesia. So uh, there has been multiple uh, ways. One would be a four-point uh, uh, transverse abdominis plane block or a uh, right external oblique internal coastal block. All these have been shown to have good uh, pain control and to reduce the opioid requirement. Uh, prophylactic nasogastric intub uh, intubation is no longer uh, recommended. And uh, abdominal drain or routine placement is also not indicated in cases without a biliary recommendation, uh, in cases where there is no biliary uh, reconstruction. Intraoperative hypothermia has to be uh, managed with multimodal temperature management, including a, a forced air warmer or a hot IV fluid warmer and uh, the other the normal diet should be implemented as soon as possible after the hepatectomy and in patients who are malnourished or having complications where you are ex expecting that the patient would not be able to get back on enteral feeds has to be considered for other parenteral or uh, supplemental nutrition. Uh, glycemic control, they recommend insulin therapy to maintain normal glycemia in the range of 8.3 uh, millimoles per liter which correspond to roughly around less than uh, around 160 to 180. Uh, and other would be a surgical technique for in preventing the delayed gastric emptying. Uh, in terms of simulation of bowel movement, like laxatives, chewing gum, uh, although they have been shown to reduce the time to the first flatus of stool, there is not much of an impact on the morbidity rate and there is no uh, recommendation on that as such. Uh, early mobilization is has to be established as soon as possible uh, after the uh, uh, surgery and uh, the optimal duration, uh, there is no recommendation. Uh, PONV prophylaxis, a multimodal approach has to be used and at least two drugs has to be used such as dexamethasone or antencetron. Uh, coming to the terms of uh, fluid management, uh, during or pre before the hepatic transection, they do recommend to have the uh, central venous pressure kept at low, around uh, less than 5, and uh, balanced crystalloid would be the choice over uh, 0.9 saline. And a goal-directed fluid therapy, which was based on your cardiac output and end profusion organ, is better than uh, restrictive or liberal. And even, especially in cases where the uh, intraoperative uh, liver section is done before... Uh, if, when the CVP is maintained low before the intraoperative uh, resection, the goal-directed fluid therapy might be more useful because we tend to uh, over-perfuse after. Uh, especially in patients who have uh, comorbidities, elderly, major resections, reduced cardiac function, or having two-step uh, surgeries where you have a hepatectomy as well as a nephrectomy. Or so. Uh, so that comes to the uh, conclusion of the uh, uh, presentation. I would ask ma'am to uh, say a few words now. Yeah, Dr. Satish, it was a lovely presentation.
and we do have a few questions. Uh, some of them, most of them have been answered. But then uh, I'd like you to tell me why was advanced hemodynamic monitoring not used in this patient? Was it used firstly? And uh, if not, then why not? Uh, so we have invasive blood pressure monitoring in this patient. And although the patient had a history of an angiography done and he is an elderly patient with diabetes and uh, hypertension, the patient did have a good effort tolerance and the cardiac function of the patient as shown in the echocardiography was uh, good. So given that we would not, uh, and we also have a pulse pressure uh, volume, uh, sorry, pulse pressure variation that can be detected from the uh, invasive blood pressure monitoring, which would work as a good uh, subject, uh, surrogate for our goal-directed fluid therapy. So I think in this particular case, given that the patient was not so clinically compromised and the comorbids were also controlled um, by towards the surgery, maybe the decision for the uh, advanced hemodynamic monitoring was not uh, considered. Uh, was cost factor also an issue? I mean, had you been uh, provided with, say... Uh... If you weren't supposed to use disposables that were costing 25,000 like in uh, Hemosphere, would you have used a hemodynamic monitor? Uh, definitely, ma'am. I'm sure that uh, at least in the uh, in in our kind of uh, middle income to uh, low income countries usually tend to have this cost uh, benefit analysis. Surgery, it's always better to use advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Then you have a new index like HPI, you know, hypotension prediction index. You can predict the hypotension, take action beforehand. This patient had 5.5 liters of bleeding. So, I mean, it would have been a good idea had it been available. But since it wasn't available, maybe or maybe the cost factor. Yes, Dr. Vanna. So, uh, two things. Now, cardiac output monitoring is not for everybody. Oh, only high-risk patients, we've gone away from that. Cost definitely is an issue, but when we talk of HPI and liver resection, it, it cannot be used in patients with liver who are undergoing liver resection because they're, they're, um, the algorithm is not uh, for liver resection. It's not being studied, and they are working on it. So currently, we cannot use it. And again, then there also is a cost. So you do need to take into consideration the cost. But in this case, I don't think so. Um, even if I had the funding, we would use uh, cardiac output monitoring because he's got a normal coronaries, long-standing comorbidities, but functionally, he's doing well. So I would, you know... I wouldn't say that cardiac output monitoring should be for every patient. Anybody else would like to differ? Or we all agree with what Dr. Vanna says? I guess so. Okay, so uh, the next question is for ma'am, for you to answer, Dr. Vijaya, ma'am. We all know that there's been a mortality reduction from 20% in 1970 to almost less than 2% now for hepatic resection. So what, in your view, are the major contributing factors for this reduction? Is it prehabilitation? Is it something else? Um, Ma'am, would you like to answer that? Anybody else would like to answer that? Uh, Ma'am, please. Madam, we cannot hear you. Not audible, ma'am. Um, I guess there's some technical glitch.
could someone help us with this? I, I think it's Vijay Madam's uh, issues there in network somewhere. Uh, could somebody else take up that question maybe then since we since ma'am is not audible? Dr. Vanna, would you like to pitch in? Yeah, yeah. Can you just repeat the question? Madam is, uh, you know, log yeah. joining again. Can you just right. I have a question for you. Uh, we've all witnessed a mortality reduction from 20% to less than 2% in the last uh, 40 years as far as liver resection patients are concerned. Mm -hmm. What in yes. your are the major contributing factors for this uh, reduction in mortality and morbidity? Multifactorial. Better, yeah, better surgery, cues up, rehabilitation. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you, if you, so we can go in a systematic way. So if you take surgery, they have got fancy tools and devices, which, um, you know, help cut and coagulate um, easier. So technological advances, more centralized care. So high volume centers are dealing with complex cases. So more focused or surgeons who are doing the difficult cases are doing the thing. Then the second thing is in anesthesia, we've come a long way. So it's not only prehabilitation, it's the whole uh, perioperative care that has changed over the years, which has led to improved outcomes. Uh, we've all realized that prehabilitation makes a lot of difference, including our surgeons. So they also want the patient to have nutritional optimization as well as exercise and in um, pulmonary optimization before they come up for surgery. So there are, and obviously coming to the post-operative bit, we have advances in intensive care, um, you know, better management of patients since, you know, when we had a higher mortality. Madam, can you add to it? We still cannot hear you. <laughs> Not audible, ma'am. We would love to hear from you. I hope this gets sorted. Um, can you hear us? Of course. Ma'am, can you hear us? <laughs> can you log on to your from your phone? In the meantime, uh, Dr. Shagun, uh, Dr. Tapas can yeah, add Dr. from... Uh, <laughs> can answer another question? Yeah, as uh, Dr. Pantana has said, uh, so basically, um, yes, uh, it, it's because of the better understanding of the liver anatomy, the physiology over the last 40 years. Then secondly, all the... Uh, uh, new types of assessment that we are doing now regularly, all the patients who are having post-repo liver resections, they undergo the CT volumetry, uh, the ICG scan, if they have a, a preoperative normal bilirubin levels and all these things. So how we can determine depending on, uh, and also the scoring systems for uh, how uh, severe is the liver cirrhosis. Because from CTP, now we are also using the MELD scoring systems. We are using MELD sodium systems, uh, depending on the liver dysfunction, when these patients are coming for the liver resections. So the understanding is significantly improved with that regard. Uh, also, uh, the uh, perioperative uh, techniques, uh, the uh, preoperative uh, optimization, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, interoperative... Uh, uh, Sorry, my voice was echoing. Um, uh, Intraoperative uh, uh, analgesia uh, techniques, uh, the post-operative uh, critical care uh, pathways, uh, everything uh, has improved. Uh, and uh, most uh, importantly, uh, even the uh, uh, surgical uh, techniques. Uh, also, uh, fluid uh, management uh, techniques, uh, uh, how we are managing them initially, uh, and uh, also the monitoring principles that we have now in terms of uh, advanced cardiac output monitoring, uh, as and when necessary, depending on the case. Uh, also, we have uh, increased use of things like uh, TEG and uh, Rotem, uh, increased monitoring of your acid-based status and perioperative investigations as well. All right, that was good. Well, TEG, uh, in this particular patient, LY30 was really, really high. 
you know l by 30 was i guess what was it around 8.9 was it uh, so the preoperative was 8.9 and intraoperative uh, it had come to 30 yeah so with such a high l by 30 what is the diagnosis you know tech is a very powerful tool as far as coagulopathy is concerned so what is your take on a uh, l by 30 of uh, say such a high l by 30 and what should be the what should the cut off be for taking measures to you know curb this like measures like so, eaca Tenexa. what is your cut off value when you give tenexa so normally uh, when we are assessing for uh, this uh, this is definitely suggestive of a hyperfibrinolysis is occurring. We also all correlate and speak to the surgeons how the field is. Maybe normally we should see clinically also how it is doing. So normally the surgeon starts saying that whatever you're giving is bleeding out. The field is very oozy. And uh, when there is hyperfibrinolysis, we start seeing many other uh, factors. I mean, just ex apart from the numbers also, you can start seeing some hematuria occurring from the right tube. You're going to see some blood coming out at such a high level of 30. So normally around 10 to 15 would be the level at which uh, we would start loading the patient with initial 15 to 20 mg per kg of uh, tranexamic acid. And thereafter, repeat it every 15 to 20 minutes till we get a better control and uh, normally, there, again, there is a protocol for uh, whether a repeated bolus is better or subsequently putting the patient on an infusion till we uh, get a better resolution of the symptoms, improvement in the field and the ooze. And uh, automatically, things like the hematuria and the blood coming out from all the, uh, uh, basically, a uh, lot of chances of bleeding, uh, rise tube and everything, it starts reducing. So that's how we treat the fibrinolysis. Okay, right. So, uh, as for the exact a nasogastric tube should not be placed in these patients. So, uh, as per your protocol, are you placing a nasogastric tube in these patients or not? Yes. All all, all GI, surgeon, GI patients get a nasogastric tube, but um, um, some of the patients, like small resections, we remove it on table, but by and large, it comes out on the next day. Yeah, so you you are, uh, you know, placing a nasogastric tube despite the ERAS protocol, which says you should not place them and remove them as quickly as possible. Maybe. No. So the ERAS don't say don't put it. They do not want the patients to have nasogastric tube in the post-operative period because of the discomfort it causes. True. And they want the patient to be fed. So if you have a, you know, nasogastric tube, swallowing is a problem. Patient has irritation in the back of the throat. So they want it to come out. Having said that, when they do cholangios with liver, okay, there is a lot of dissection of the duodenum. So the surgeons will never take it out the next day. In fact, they would have a nasogenal as a backup should, should there be a, a delayed gastric emptying. So yes, it is put, but it should come out. It, it's not that it's a complete no-no. It needs to come out as soon as possible. It should not be there for wait till the bowel sound return and you know what the surgical tenets are usually another thing uh it's recommended that we give six weeks four to six weeks of prehabilitation prior to liver resection so would the tumor not have progressed to the next stage by then what is your take on that so it's not a, a definite four to six weeks you know um you should get at least at least two weeks of optimization. And again, it depends on the patient's condition, how frail the patient is, how nutritionally. The, if the patient is se severely compromised, the surgeon themselves wouldn't want to subject the patient to surgery and they would opt for, you know, better optimization. So I don't think so. It's a rigid number of four to six well-preserved patients can undergo between two weeks without any issues. As long as I should have, uh, you know, how 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 much is the albumin drop, the trend that is there, and are they eating? Are they not eating? Do they are they taking their supplement uh, feeds or not? It all depends on all that. Are they exercising? So I don't think so. It would wait. You would want to wait four to six weeks. But having said that, that we discussed this with our surgeons. It's waiting for. Three to four weeks doesn't really make so much of a difference to the oncological outcome per se, which is what is generally feared that the cancer is going to progress. So, in fact, optimization goes a long way. 
um, in in helping them recover uh, soon after surgery. So maybe we can put so it in small surgery, like a breast surgery. We can say go ahead with four to six weeks, and for liver resections in frail patients, we can again take some more time. But in healthy patients undergoing liver resection, maybe we could reduce it to two weeks. <laughs> maybe yes, yes, so yes. And but breast patients, I don't think so. You really need to, you know, um, subject them through, you know rehabilitation because it's a surface surgery it's a daycare procedure so they can get back to their oh. normal diet on the same day mm -hmm. can you hear me can you hear me now oh of course ma'am you're audible yeah, okay no so you have just one point that the how much period you can wait doesn't depend on what surgery you are doing ultimately you have to discuss with the surgeons how much period because in the breast as you typically said generally if they have to postpone the case or you have to delay the surgery they may give additional chemotherapy. So it doesn't depend on whether it's a surface surgery or thing. It depends on the biology of a cancer, biology of a tumor. And here your discussion with the surgeons as a team effort is more important. Agreed, ma'am. Uh, the next question, what in your view should be the ideal CVP during uh, liver resection? Your surgeons would want you, you know, to keep it as close to zero as possible. You feel five is okay or something lower than that this question is directed towards me anybody who wants okay. to answer our surgeon can answer that quest question for low cv uh, guess... so normally nowadays uh, you know, most of the surgeons they don't ask for very low cvps also because they know the risks of very low cvp as well um, the thing is nowadays we're using a lot of ppv and uh, there are a lot of papers which are saying, and we have also used in some cases, we don't go completely by the CVP, rather the PPV also. So if you maintain them between 10 and 20, so like, you know, rather than just focusing only on the CVP. So if it is above 10, so it means that the patient is not very full. At the same time, if it's less than 18, 20, uh, that means the patient is not too dry. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, if we can maintain this and just not bank on the CVP, because the risk of keeping very low CVP, again, risk of embolism is there. And then the acid also sets in much faster. In these patients, the need for inotropic support increases if the urine output starts dropping, if we keep very low CVP also. The surgeon uh, you know, this will reduce the bleeding and then like, okay. so you still think that something around 10 is okay. CVP around 10 is okay for you? I mean, Dr. Tapas? Uh, I wouldn't keep a CVP of around 10. Around 5, uh, around five 6 is fine, but uh, I wouldn't keep a CVP of uh, 10. Okay, so you mean 5, 6, nothing? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Your voice was breaking. Do we all agree the 5 to 6 is Okay, we should we don't need to go below that or above that. I have a comment here. You know, uh, we need to understand. You know, yes, our surgeons fancy the number five and less, but we must realize that CVP does not correlate. And in the studies which have shown that it does not correlate with portal venous pressures and hepatic venous venous pressures. So, and, uh, you know, putting the transducer up and down by a distance of 5 centimeters makes a 3.5 millimeter difference. I mean, how relevant is that value? You know, the magnitude of error is, is 75 to 100 percent, depending upon where you put the transducer. And the surgeon is miraculously very happy and satisfied with the field. So, you know, it's a difficult thing to say that don't keep the CVP5 because the surgeons insist on it. But... Um, we fortunate our surgeons don't ask for low CVP, but having said that, we should move towards more uh, uh, what you call um, robust, uh, like measuring. Hear you. More robust means of measuring. Yeah, the so yeah, so we can we can look at the dynamic indices which have been shown to uh, correlate uh, better than CVP with blood loss. So you could use stroke volume variation if you have cardiac output monitoring facilities majority of the studies are done on that 
CPV can be used as a surrogate as long as you keep it high. So basically restricting fluid during resection and then resuscitate them soon after uh, resection. Can I make one comment? Sure. Yeah, so as you keep on saying CVP, 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 why CVP leads to, if at all, that worry of increased blood loss is generally because your IVC will be full. So rather than looking at CVP as a number, even your surgeon will tell you that IVC looks full, IVC looks turgid. Can you go down on it? So then you can take measures. So you can have CVP monitoring there, but rather than looking at number, look at the surgical fields, ask surgeon, is he okay? Because most of the time, surgeon himself will tell that, you know, sort of come down on CVP. So we get clinical signs, which are the most reliable. Right, ma'am. We take that. Okay, so we all agree that the thoracic epidural catheter placement is definitely indicated for open liver resection. But uh, laparoscopic removal of small benign uh, liver lesions do not, does not require an epidural catheter. But how about robotic surgery? Robotic liver resection for malignant tumors. Would you place a thoracic epidural catheter for those? No, we would not. Ma'am, even you would not place a thoracic epidural for a robotic uh, malignant liver resection? You're asking me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no. Actually, um, one of my students had done the thesis on liver resections and epidural catheters. And we did find significant number of patients had uh, INR, which was raised on second and third post-op day. And almost seven, I think out of 150 patients, eight odd patients, we had to defer removing the epidural catheter for two more days because of the coagulopathy. So generally we remove on fifth day or we had to remove on the seventh day. So the thing is that if you have got now better regional techniques, you can, wound infiltration has shown to be a good marker. You have got uh, facial plane blocks. Then why to go for epidural catheter? At such now the world has started moving away from central neuraxial blockade. And for this robotic again with the small incisions, I really don't think it's needed. Okay, finally, so Experts agree on this, that no epidural catheter required for robotic, uh, say, liver resections. But we all do place them for open uh, liver resections. Uh, would anybody like to add something on whether immunonutrition is required for such patients? Fancy new things like, uh, say, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, all that. I mean, I think you, it's not immunonutrition is not for all. It's only patients who are severely malnourished that also three to four days before surgery. But by and large, it's a no-no for, pre, you know, from a nutritional optimization point of view. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. Somebody has asked about the role of colloids in liver resections. What colloids are preferred if used? Can I answer this question? Vandana can also answer, yeah. So actually, this is a point that I really want to uh, make even from the Nitin's presentation. So first of all, if you look at your ERAS guidelines, they also say use physiological crystalloids, balanced salt solution, and not colloids. So the problem is here, if you understand the physiology, you really don't need colloids. So studies have shown crystalloids and colloids are good enough. And if at all you have to use colloids currently, the best colloids are albumin. Then you have to weigh the risk benefit between giving albumin versus managing the patients on crystalloids. So if you have got patients who have got really that you are doing these borderline resections of the liver where you expect that your FLR is going to be less, patient is badly serotic, patient is low on nutrition, you may consider giving albumin. But I do not think that on routine basis, you need to have with colloids to these patients. Second thing I just want to point out from the Nitin's presentation where he has written that patients post-op when they shifted the patient's lactates were four point something odd. And then he mentioned that in the ICU, albumin was given and the patient's lactates recovered. Again, whenever you think of giving fluid or colloids for that matter, you do not look at lactates in any post-op patients and never in liver because your lactate can be because of liver dysfunction at that time. You have to always target to do your hemodynamic monitoring. So if I feel that my patient is hypoperfused from my clinical examination, that patient has got delayed capillary refill, patient has cold, clammy periphery, if I have got an arterial line, it shows narrow pulse pressure, low blood pressure. In those cases, I look for the fluid responsiveness and then I'll think of giving fluid, but not because patients 
lactates are high and that everyone has to understand that do not target lactates for giving fluids crystalloids or colloids in the patients with uh, post operative patients and never in the delivery section cases because when you uh, in these patients again the second thing uh, if i may take some time that when you give more fluids to these patients you will cause increase or sort of hypovolemia your cvp will go down which actually will decrease the perfusion at liver is the first one to take the hit because of the back pressure liver will get congested which will cause decreased rate of your liver which is going to get repaired or regenerate that will also get hampered so you have to be very very careful when you are giving fluids to the liver that doesn't mean you leave the patient hypovolemic but you ask yourself this question do i need to give fluids to the patient in the post operative liver stage colloids again is open to debate but currently there is zero evidence for giving albumin and your eras guidelines also support that very well summarized ma'am uh, i guess we have time for one last question in the chat box it says should intraoperative blood product transfusion always be guided by teg in these cases dr tapas could you answer that um i would say that not for all cases do we need to always use tag for intraoperative uh, blood transfusion uh, because first of all uh, tag it may be limited in uh, uh, as a resource that's number one secondly it is quite expensive to conduct so i think it is more about the clinical so we can of course uh, use a conventional methods of how we transfuse the blood but yes as in this particular case when there was a five and a half liter blood loss this was a very good indication to use perioperative tag monitoring right from intraoperative and continuing the same trend into the post operative but if it was much lesser loss and uh, we just had to transfuse possibly one to few few units of uh, uh period of the blood of blood products then in, the, in those cases i would not use a tag uh anybody so uh, to summarize i would say that not in all cases it is necessary uh dr jotsna ma'am dr sohan sir anybody else would like to add something dr pan so um, what we have studied is that you know the inr may be prolonged but the tag is always normal in fact hypercoagulable and like we've done a study where we've looked at serial tags done obviously based on the clinician's discretion as to when they wanted the tag and the ffps which we would normally would have transfused with a high inr we managed to kind of you know not transfuse because the tag was uh, normal. normal or hypercoagulable so if you have if so for small resections it doesn't really matter but where you have major resections and there is loss i would suggest that you should consider tag because at the end you are transfusing blood products so we need to be a little responsible when we are doing it especially when we know that in liver um resections or lip patients with uh, coming up for liver resections they can be rebalance of their clotting as well as anti coagulants uh, in the body so it's better to you know give it targeted rather than empirically just give it uh i get we exceeded the time limit uh thank you all the expert panelists and thank thank you dr jotsna for joining in over to dr sohan for summarizing it and uh, for a maybe what of thanks yeah no dr sohan do did we answer all the questions in the chat box no uh, we have some more there are so many questions there we we've, we've taken up most of them but maybe there is okay there is an uh, okay i can think... answer i think we can go like uh, for half an hour more but we have to answer at least the questions whatever are there in the chat box okay right there is one question which says can you explain utility of flr and icg clearance test what is the current evidence on this dr vanna anybody would like to take that so flr is um... the volumetric estimation of future liver remnant which is done based on ct and uh, software which is built into the program and uh, which will tell them what is the likely uh, remnant going to be and uh, icg is a functional test of liver now uh, it is important to know flr because uh, uh, patients with cirrhosis 
normal patients, let me put it this way, in patients with normal liver, they can go up to 25 to 30, 25% FLR because the liver will regenerate because the liver is healthy. Somebody with uh, cirrhosis, any surgeon would want to stay above 40. Again, depending on how bad the cirrhosis is, whether it's NASH or it's, uh, you know, proper full-blown cirrhosis, it depends on that. So it tells you the functional uh, liver function. The only thing with ICG is if the patient has got hyperbilirubinemia, it is not reliable. But per se, any major resection, a surgeon would do a FLR in an ICG. ICG gives us a more functional uh, uh, aspect of liver, whereas FLR tells us about the volumetric, um, possibly volumetric size of the liver remnant. Uh, there's another question which says, challenges in getting the surgical team on board with the ERAS protocol components like early feed initiation, early catheter, drain and tube removal, etc., where the surgical and decision, surgical unit decision plays a major role. This is a question, I guess, it's already been answered. Then by, you know, by the answers to various other questions. So mostly we've covered everything, sir. It's just that the questions have been put up in a different way. But then there's a new one which yeah. says, comments on N-acetyl uh, cysteine infusion post-operatively. So any comments on that? There is and no role and mm -hmm. there is no evidence. <laughs> yeah, so if you talk post-op, no, would... <laughs> the surgeon, surgeon still believe to prevent the renal injury or for liver generation, but there's absolutely no role of N-acetyl cysteine in either of the scenario. So... Doesn't make a difference. So I uh, would just want now to add to that. In a liver trans sorry. Yeah. No, carry on, carry on, please. Sorry, I was just going to say that nowadays, even in many centers of liver transplant, they're not using uh, an acetyl cysteine no. routinely. Earlier, they were using, but nowadays, uh, NAC, they've stopped using it because it, uh, there is no evidence for it. No. Yeah, in fact, even continuing the infusion in the post operative period, there is no evidence. I just want to add to that surgical team on board with ERAS protocol components regarding early feeding and all that. I would say do not, you know, discuss about drain removal. Surgeons love drains, okay? There is no surgeon who will not put a drain, irrespective of how small the surgery is. But you can definitely discuss on the feeding bit. So you can start off with feeding clear liquids. And, and slowly get them on board. If you radically make them do everything together, they are not going to be on board. Uh, there's a question by Dr. Indira. She's asked us whether to use nitrous oxide or not. And uh, is there air embolism involved? Nitrous oxide and risk of air embolism. So, uh, Vandana, you want to answer? Dr. Yeah, Vandana? so we, we use mm. nitrous oxide and we've not had any air embolism so far. Uh, I think the risk of air embolism is more with robotic and minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery because the sinuses are open and we have a pneumo already created. But that's CO2 embolism, obviously. Um, so, We've at least not experienced and we routinely use nitrous oxide. Uh, I guess we've uh, finished with all the questions then. We've so uh, I'd like to I'd like to bring out a few points which are actually not asked in chat box, chat box, but when Nitin presented the few things that I saw, just for the student's perspective. So, uh, so the thing is that first Nitin, you said that ECG was normal. I don't think his ECG was normal. He had clear-cut QS pattern in inferior leads and he had poor progression of R waves in the chest leads. This was the patient who was diabetic in whom you can have silent MI. So anyway, this patient had coronary angiography done before that. So you could say, but you cannot say that ECG is normal. The second thing is we, we are just focusing on ERAS and the major things, but we are forgetting the basic housekeeping. I'm seeing that patient's sugar who is a diabetic had been all ABGs were sugar, showing sugar of 200 plus which where probably with at least in our centers are good centers, we should start keeping your sugar control 
from intraop to the postoperative period. So intraop in these patients, we should not be neglecting that. And the third thing is just a small point is second or third of your ABG shows PCO2 of 45. Okay, so at that stage, probably I would like to look at what is my ETCO2 and what is my PACO2. That if it's the gradient, it increases telling me that my patient's cardiac output has dropped. And then I'll make active efforts to see whether my patient requires fluid and patient requires vasopressors. So what I'm saying is rather than concentrating on uh, um, advanced monitoring system, even these small, small things gives us lots of information and lots of clues. So uh, it's good that you think about cardiac output monitor and other things, but don't neglect these small things or don't underestimate them. You can get, out, get lots of information and you can manage your patient much better without even the advanced monitoring systems. Thanks. Thank you. I guess it's over to Dr. Sohan. Yeah. So, thank you very much. So, I think it was a good discussion on overall liver resection and uh, intra-op management and uh, everything. So, I hope we all learned something to, uh, today. And I thank you, uh, Nitin, and I also thank Dr. Shagun, um, Jam Madam, Dr. Mandana, and Dr. Tapas. So, thank you very much for joining today. And over to Asia. Asha, you're there? <clears throat> I think the cleaner people are busy somewhere. <laughs> So can we sign off? Yeah, yeah. Please sign off. So thank you okay. very much. You can all, you can thank all, you. All thank you all. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. Hello, Asha, sir. There? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm there. Sir, shall I end the yeah. session, sir? Yes, yes. Please end. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.